Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wonderful anointing of the Holy Ghost that's here today. Powerful Spirit of the Lord. And we're going to go to the Word of the Lord today. And it is a, an honor to stand before such wonderful young people, ministers who are here today. I'm thankful for you. And I, I stand before you today with a burden on my heart. And I believe that the Lord is going to talk to us, amen, this afternoon. We need God to help us, Atlantic District. We need the Holy Ghost, amen, to do a work in our hearts and our minds today. Amen. I, I want to just give a quick shout out to the two people that I love dearly and I consider them best friends are my mom and my dad over here. I'm so thankful they came. Amen. This afternoon, give my mom and my dad a hand, would you please? <clears throat> Love my parents, amen. Took me to church, I've been thankful for them so much, amen. Turn with me, if you would, into the word of the Lord to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6, a very familiar passage of scripture, amen, that we're going to read today, and I believe before we're finished, the Lord's going to have his way with us. Can somebody say amen? amen. You preach with me today? Amen. You'll preach with me today. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter number four. Amen. And verse number three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to preach to you today with the help of the Holy Ghost, and I pray as how I felt God poured in, I can pour it right back out again on this title, Your not the answer. You're not the answer. Lift up your hands, if you would, all across this, amen, church this afternoon. Help me out here, guys. Lift up your hands right now, and ask the Lord. Amen. In your, in your praise, God wants to hear you say it. I can pray it from up here. I know. I want you to pray. God, let me hear your word today. Jesus, I pray your anointing touches my heart today. Prepare your heart right now, young person, to receive the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, we love you. We're thankful today for the Holy Ghost. We're thankful today for your word. We're thankful that it is forever settled in heaven. It cannot be changed. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority of the word of the Lord, and the power in your awesome name, in Jesus' name, when the faith in this house, I pray your word will go forth in Jesus' name. And Everyone said amen. 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 High five two or three people around you and say, I'm going to spread the gospel. I'm going to spread the gospel. God bless you today. You can be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. Scholars, scholars, real smart people, so I, I can't really relate that much, but uh, really smart guys named scholars refer to something called 400 years of silence. It's, it's the time frame or the time uh, uh, that spans from the closing verses of Malachi to the preaching of John the Baptist. 146,000 silent nights pass into history. World powers would shift from east to west. It's during this 400 years of silence that a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, perhaps the worst persecutor of God's people, the Jews, he defiles the temple by offering a pig for sacrifice. He began to forbid the worship to Jehovah, and he outlawed all of their rites and sacred ordinances. It's during this time that a man named Judas Maccabeus has led what is known as the Maccabean Revolt against Antiochus, and he reclaimed the temple and he cleansed it. It was a victory in the midst of a dark time. But nevertheless, we call that span from the Old Testament to the New Testament 400 years of silence. 
And although God was silent, hear me today, it did not mean he stopped working. Although God was silent, it did not mean he ceased being God. God didn't take a 400-year vacation. He didn't check out for 400 years. It might have been silent, but God works and exists in the silence. As uneventful in the prophetic as those 400 years might have been, there were people of God who were clinging to the prophetic words spoken by the prophets. A prophet such as Malachi himself in the Old Testament when he wrote the words in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. These words from a man of God were tucked away deep within the hearts of those enduring silence. Deep within the heart of faith that one day a messenger would come and would prepare the way for the Messiah. Malachi 3 and 1 is an example of the value and the virtue of the messenger. He speaks of two messengers in his passage. The first being John the Baptist. And the other when scripture says whom shall come to his temple. The message of the covenant being Jesus Christ. Two messengers but one message. I believe that those who endured the final years of silence were looking for John before they were looking for Jesus. They were praying for a messenger to prepare the way. In an ancient royal procession, the messenger went before the king to announce his arrival, to indicate the route, and to remove any obstacles in the road. And John the Baptist fulfilled this exact ministry for Jesus Christ. He broke through the silence. It was John they were praying for. It was John they were looking for because they knew if they found the messenger that the Messiah was close by. If they could find the one who was preparing the way, they could soon experience the one who is the way. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. I'm here to tell some young person in the Atlantic District, you're not the answer to your school's problems, your family's issues, or your situations that haunt you at work. You're not the answer for a world spiraling out of control. Yeah, you're hearing me correctly. You're not the answer. But before you check out and you stop listening, please indulge me for a moment. In John chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, the scriptures read clear to us, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. But he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John, I'm sorry, but as a great a man that you were, and as profound and powerful and popular as you were, and as anointed and God called as you were, you were not the answer. He was not the light. Verse 19, and this is the record of John. When the Jews and then the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask you, John, you're preaching. John, you're reaching. Who? Who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou a prophet? He answered, no, and they said unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? John said, I, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way 
of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. John, you were set apart for the cause of the gospel of the kingdom in all of your abilities and your attributes and your talents in the way you drew crowds unto yourself to hear the preaching of repentance. You're still not the answer. Then who are you, John? Who are you then? And what are you doing here? Verse 25, and they asked him and said, Why baptizest thou then if thou be not the Christ or Elias, neither thou a prophet? And John answered and said, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you whom you know not. He, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. John, who are you? I'm the voice preparing the way for the one. Don't complicate the call, students, uh, and don't overthink the mission. Uh, you're called not to be the answer, but to tell them the answer. You're called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't misunderstand me when I say that we're not the answer. We know we're not the answer, but thank God we do know the answer. In and of ourselves, we are powerless. John 15 and 51, I am the vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I don't care how eloquent the preacher, how big the crowd, how excellent the worship team is. If there's no Jesus, there's no answer. If there's no repentance, then there's no answer. If there's no baptism by immersion in the name of, I wish somebody preached with me. If there's not baptism in the name of Jesus Christ then there is no answer. If there is not the Holy Ghost, then there is no answer. We are not the answer. Jesus is. If there's no cross, then there's no answer. Listen to me today. The devil is fine with crowds, but he hates crosses. He doesn't mind if you attend church. He loves awesome worship bands, but he is never in favor of a cross. The cross settled his death. The cross crushed his plan. The cross erased the power of sin. And he hates the cross. Paul said in Colossians 2, 13 and 15, and you, everyone say me, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross Woo! nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show. He made a show openly, uh, triumphing over them. Uh, you want to talk about getting your praise on? Uh, you want to talk about running aisles? Uh, you want to talk about worshiping Jesus? I'd love for somebody to get excited about the cross. If you're going to praise, help me somebody. If you're going to praise about anything, you best be praising for a cross. If you're going to lift God up for anything, you best lift him up for the cross. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. He was talking about the cross. Woo! If you're going to run the aisles, run them for the cross. If you're going to raise your hands, open your mouth, you do it for the cross. It's the cross that saves. It's the cross that delivers. I feel it's about time this district gets reacquainted with the beauty of the cross. Yeah. 
It's not pretty. It's not glamorous. It's not attractive. But it's the death of Jesus on the cross that gave you a way out of your sin and put the devil in the back seat. The devil was fine with Jesus wearing a crown but did not want him to wear a cross. He was fine with Jesus walking about. But when the conversation of the cross became a reality, it put fear into his heart. Luke 4, 5 and 8. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world. Of a moment in time. And the devil said unto him, all this power I'll give thee, and the glory of them... For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. It's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. The devil attempted to disrupt the path to the cross. He tried to intercept Jesus by tempting him with power and possession. In an attempt to have him give up. On the people. You see, the devil loves to pull you up to the table of negotiation. And he'll work out a deal for you. He'll bless you with popularity, possessions, and even power in hopes that you never touch a cross. Get in the way of that young man. He's getting close to a cross. Get in the way at that young lady who consecrated last night to be a missionary. Get in her way. She's about to pick up a cross. We have something that happens in the book of Genesis. It's an amazing story about Abraham who was sent out in the battle of the kings in Genesis 14. And a member of his family, his name is Lot, has been taken captive. And the Bible reads, when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, and by night smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus and he brought back all the goods and also against also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the woman also and the people he sent out for some people look what happens when the king of Sodom meets up with him verse 21 a great victory just happened and the king of Sodom slithers in the equation right now and offers a suggestion he says Abraham let me offer you something and the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take thyself the goods. You, you give me the people and I'll give you the possession. You, you give, me, give me all that you took by way of Lot and his family and his wife and I'll give you all the possessions. That's cut a deal right now. Listen, the devil has no problem with you pursuing possession. He's got no problem with you overemphasizing materialism. He'll cut you a deal. He'll let you have power. He'll let you have possessions. He'll gladly give it to you in hopes for one reason alone, that you'll not go near the people. Abraham, I can just see the fire in Abraham's eyes as he looked back at the king of Sodom. He said, king, I didn't fight this battle for possessions. I fought this battle for the people. I didn't come all this way. Bring my people with me. Fight blood, sweat, and tears for possessions. I came for the people. I'm telling somebody in this house today, you got to get your mind off of possession. It's about the people. Get your mind off of things and get them onto the people. Get them onto the people. In Jesus' name. Abraham. I don't mind if you take possessions, money, and expensive items. Just leave me the people. Abraham didn't fight for things. He fought for people. May I say to you, the devil tempts this generation most of all with possessions because he wants people very badly. Be successful. Just don't touch the people. Be wealthy. Just don't touch the people. Go to university. 
Just don't touch the people. Go to work. Don't touch the people. Our enemy loves and desires to have people. Guess what? So does Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die on a cross for possession. Jesus didn't take that thing up Mount Calvary and lay his life down for a building, for a paycheck, for possessions. He laid his life down for people. He laid his life down for you. He laid his life down for your lost dad, your lost mom, your college, your school, your professor. He did not do this thing for any other reason other than people. Lift our hands all across this church right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah. He did it for the people. So when you begin to worship the Lord, uh, I bet you worship for the cross. Uh, I beg you bring that cross back into your mind. Uh, I pray that you would have an understanding of the value of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's the cross that still saves. You can't bypass the cross. Uh, you can't adapt anything around it. It is uh, what it is. Uh, there's Hallelujah. There's no easy way around this, people. There's no shift and left uh, and to the right, uh, but a straight line. Uh, there is still a cross. And there are still people. The devil didn't want to see the sacrifice on the cross. He didn't want to see the pure sin-washing blood of Jesus shed. So he attempted to provide Jesus with an alternative route. Take what you want. Be who you want. But don't go to the cross. In this generation, the devil still speaks. Go to church. Lift up your hands. Participate in service. Call yourself Pentecostal and apostolic. Raise your hands. Run the aisles. Shout. Take whatever you want. Just don't pick up your cross. Just don't touch the cross. Because if you begin to touch the cross, you begin to lay up more than just possession. That's a personal life that you lay down at the feet of Jesus Christ. Matthew 16 and 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Without a cross, there's no gospel. There's no revival. There's no relationship, and there is no answer. That's why today, apostolic young people, whenever you get the chance to worship, you worship about that cross. That's why whenever you get the chance to pick up your cross, you pick it up because it's a, it's a sign of discipleship. It's the cross that we bear that precedes the crown we will wear. I want to make it to heaven, but i got to do it with a cross on my back. I want to reach my friends, but i got to do it with a cross on my back. I want to teach Bible studies, but I got to do it with a cross on my back. I want to go to school and fit in, but I can't go or the cross won't let me. Yeah, I got to have a cross in my life. I have a cross in my life. I have a cross in my life. When you get a handle on the cross, you can't help but speak of the gospel that you so love and you hear about. Your youth group has the answer to your school. Well, I said your youth group has the answer to your school. I said your youth group has the answer to your community, to your city, and to your world. You, you have it. You've got the answer. You possess it every day. You hold in your heart and mind and spirit the answer to the world's issues. You hold in your possession and your power to walk to and fro from school with the answer tucked in your heart. With the person you share coffee with or the one you go to school with, ride the bus with, you have the answer. But if our gospel Paul said, if our gospel, if it's mine to share. Paul said, our gospel. 
I partake in that gospel. It's mine. When I have, in, when I have received the salvation of Jesus Christ, baptism in his name, infilling of the Holy Ghost, it's a part of the gospel. It's our gospel. I can, I can share that. And the Bible says in, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 6, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. We have the answer. But we hide it in our church. It's not hidden from my pastor. It's not hidden from my fellow youth mate. It's not hidden from a seasoned saint. It's hidden from my classmate. It's hidden from my coworker. It's hidden from your professor. It's hidden from your coach and the waitress. We'll not grow if we don't take the gospel out from amongst ourselves. We'll not see the lost redeemed if we stay in our churches. The early church wouldn't have survived if it stayed in the upper room. They had to get out. As powerful and as amazing as Acts chapter 2 was, there was a miracle to be had in Acts chapter 3. As powerful as the Acts chapter 3 miracle was, there was a revival in Samaria to be had. As amazing as the revival the Samaritans experienced in Acts chapter 8, there was a man named Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. I think you get the point. We can't stay where we are. We've got to go and share what we have. I don't care how much you run the aisles this weekend. I don't care how high you sing, how loud you clap. The test of this weekend will endure when you put your shoes on Monday morning and you walk through your school and you go back to work. We will see how much of... Don't hide the gospel next week. Don't hide the gospel next week. Share the answer share that answer with them. They need to know and you have the keys. You have the word. You have the energy. You have the Holy Ghost. We're to proclaim the gospel to a world, not hide it. Not hide it. Mark chapter 3 and 25. If a house be divided one way, we hide the gospel a few times. Occasionally it happens. If a house be divided against itself, it cannot stand. Can I be real with you? Can I be open with you? Nothing hides the gospel any better than a youth group that has no unity. You want to hide the gospel? Bicker amongst yourselves. You want to hide the gospel? Stop worshiping together. You want to hide the gospel? Don't be faithful to your youth group. You want to you hide the gospel? Start talking and gossiping and backbiting about each other. That hides the gospel real, real well. Nothing shuts down the gospel like disunity. You want to hide it? Just keep talking. Listen, you can't spread the gospel and sow discord. You can't preach a sermon on Sunday and talk bad about your fellow youth on Monday. You can't give a Bible study on Wednesday and call down your pastor on Thursday. You want to hide the gospel? I don't think so. Get with your fellow young person and say, hey, let's promote this thing. Nothing hides any better than a group that lacks unity. Listen to me. Why? Because the world experiences a dog-eat-dog society every single day they get up. They hear the gossip at work. They hear the backbiting in the, at the school. They hear all of the bickering back and forth at home. And when they come to the house of God, there should be unity. There should be people who love one another. Want to spread the gospel? Wait at me. Got the answer? Want to spread the gospel? Well, Jesus said this. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one to another. I don't care how, how fast you run. I don't care how much you pledged last night. I, I, I don't care how many verses you quote through quizzing. If you've got aught against your brother, you've got one thing to do. 
I don't care how many cartwheels you do. I don't care if you talk in tongues from Friday to Monday. If you get up on Tuesday and you don't like somebody and you resent them, you've got something to take care of. It's called forgiveness. Let's talk about the roots of the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But at the roots of the gospel is love and reconciliation. And if you're a believer of the gospel, you'll forgive that one who's bitter towards you. If you really believe the gospel, you'll hug the neck of the person that doesn't like you. If you really want to spread the gospel, love one another. Well, that went over real well. The revival your church can have can go home and experience such explosive, explosive revival. I believe that when you begin to hug each other. I'm not trying to be all sappy, this and that. But when you pray through together, when you hold hands in the altar and touch heaven together, when you rally around your pastor together, when you knock doors together, when you cry together, when you laugh together. I want to spread the gospel, not hide it. And if I can get with my, I was somebody to high five your neighbor and say, hey, let's spread the gospel. Let's get on board. Let's be on the same team. If our gospel be hid, how do you hide it? Just start talking about people. Just start shutting people down in your youth group. I think it'd be all right today if some youth groups prayed through together. You know what they said about me last night? I don't care. Paul they, 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 they came to me on Friday and told me my dress looked terrible. Did he have his glasses on? I don't know. What was wrong with him? You don't know what they did. You don't know what they did to me last week in school. Listen, you're not justified to hold a grudge. You're not justified to take vengeance. You're not justified to keep record. You're only justified to forgive. I want to preach the gospel. I can't be the answer if I'm part of the problem. I can't be the winner I want to be for the Lord if I can't show love to my fellow youth members. Get over your petty differences. It's not worth it. Revival is more important than your personal agenda. It's not your kingdom anyway. It's his kingdom. You can't pray thy kingdom come till your kingdom goes. At the roots of the gospel is love and reconciliation and forgiveness. If you want to show the love to the world, show some love to your youth group. I think it'd be all right if we had God bring us together in a spirit of travail to heal us, to embrace us, and to commission us, to put within you and I a spirit of revival that says, hey, I can't do this by myself, but you can do it with me. I'm going to bear the cross with you. I'm going to pick up your cross and help you bear the weight of the burden that you feel because I've got free people in my life. I have friends around me. I have family around me that need the Holy Ghost, that need to be baptized in Jesus' name, that need their lives transformed there's nothing any more valuable than getting together and sharing the gospel message of Jesus Christ could you all just lift up your hands right now with me could you do that please come on now everybody lift up your hands maybe it's a different type of sermon you thought I preached today I want you to be the answer but we can't be the answer if we're not willing to get on board I want you to know what you're supposed to do in this thing but if I can't go home and be faithful to prayer meeting and faithful to worship and faithful to the house of God I'll never see revival I'll never see my church grow how many in here have a vision for your church we talk about vision we talk about seeing things into the future. We talk about 5, 10, 15 year visions. I mentioned it a couple of days ago. Listen to me right now. I would wish in this Atlantic Youth Convention that somebody, I wish you get a five year vision, but I wish and I pray to God you'd have a next Sunday vision. You'd have a next Wednesday vision. We talk about visions in the realm of we see angels and things happening in the spirit. Listen, your vision can consist of that one you want to see come to church, come to church. Your vision 
Your vision, it might be to preach to multitudes. It may be to be a missionary. It may be to be on the field in 20 years or 10 years. That's great. But I wish I could commission you not to have such a distant vision, but to have a next week vision for your church, for your worship service, for the one that's around you, for your coworker, for your classmate, that you can say, I can see them coming to church, coming to the house of God and having their lives completely transformed. Let's all stand together. I want you to be the answer because you show them the way. I want you to be the messenger that goes before Jesus Christ and shows the world the gospel. Music can come back. Let's lift our hands together. Amen. If we could do that. So easy to do this in here. We feel like we can take on the world and put it in a headlock and drag it around. I feel like we can do all kinds of mad things. But when you get out, sometimes it's difficult when you're by yourself. And we can utilize the excuse, I only have two or three people in my youth group. Uh, I've only got one or two. I'm from a small rural community. I, I don't have thousands of people to reach. You don't need thousands of people to reach. Because guess what? One person needs to hear the answer. One at a time. At a time. At a time. God, I want a downpour. God, I want to have revival. Is that your prayer? Is that your prayer? I want revival. I, I, I'm accustomed to seeing things happen outside a lot because I work outside. I'm a carpenter. And I, I know sometimes when the rain starts coming, you can see it kind of clouds start to build up. You can see things start to move in. But that downpour, it typically happens one drop at a time. One, two, three, four, five. And all of a sudden, the heavens open up. And the rain begins to descend. And the downpour happens. You know how your, your church is going to receive the greatest downpour of the Holy Ghost that happens? One soul at a time. One schoolmate at a time. Because when you walk up to them, you may not come from a rich family. You may be failing math. You're laughing, so maybe some of you are. You might not have it all together. But one thing you have going for you if you've been here this weekend is the greatest piece of information you can ever distribute to a world. It's the answer to their dilemma. It's the answer that keeps them up at night. It's the answer to their problem that they don't think they can get away from. It's the answer. It's the answer. Let's lift up our hands. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray for a few minutes here right now. I'm all done. I'm all done. I'm going to close up. I could say more. I could say more, but I won't. Come on now. Stay right there. Keep your hands raised up here. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Don't, don't hide this thing. Don't hide it through disunity. Don't hide it through attitude. Don't hide it through bitterness. Don't hide it through personal agenda. Don't hide it. Don't hide it. Most of you are sitting youth group to youth group right now. As I was just praying and asking the Lord for direction for this service, I already felt God touch my heart <clears throat> to get you to pray through together. For you to touch heaven together. Because if you can go home with a united front, with love for each other, with forgiveness, reconciliation, with the mindset that the gospel is the most important thing I'll share every week that I live. If that can happen for you, you can be together. Your revival is only a couple of days away. We can't stay in the mode of I hope next week's good church. I hope next month's good church. Get into the perspective that it's going to be good church. 
it's going to be revival because I'm going to determine that with my attitude and with my love for my fellow young person. So I know you're, maybe you're sitting in groups already as young people. Youth groups came together. But if not, if you're scattered out throughout the, throughout, through the crowd, I, I want you to get together. Everybody from every church that's here, get together. Come on down to the front. Please do that. Just come on down. Before people ever find Jesus Christ, they're going to find you first. When Jesus came to this world, they found John first. Listen, there's only one Messiah, but there are many messengers. You're not called to be the Messiah. You're just called to be the one who shows the way to him. This is beautiful, guys. It's great. I know you have pastors who carry loads together. I know you have pastors' wives who pray over you and who love you. That's it. Link right up. Crowd right in. I thought the Lord really nudged my heart that there's going to be some special things happen in this altar today. I want you to pray. I want you to touch heaven together. I, I, I really felt when I was praying that a, an anointing of travail, an anointing of intercession and love and healing and unity would come together because you need each other very badly. That's it. Right now, if you could, could you just begin to pray in that group that you're in? Maybe you're not used to doing this. Please break through that. Maybe you're not used to putting your arm around your brother or your sister. I want you to pray right now in the Holy Ghost. That's it. Come on now. God's raising up some travailers in these groups right now. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Intercessors are in here right now. Soul winners. Missionaries. All missions pastors. Campus ministry leaders. The Holy Ghost come over you. Come on, church. Come on, church. Pray. Come on, youth pastor. Step out in the authority of the Holy Ghost and pray. Come on, godly young lady. Pray. Come on, righteous young man. Pray. Your city needs you. Your community needs you. Your pastor needs you. Come on, 